Welcome to this third installment on our explanation of the amicus brief, friend of the court brief, we filed with the United States Supreme Court in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the case the Supreme Court will hear to decide whether or not Mississippi's ban on elective abortions after 15 weeks is constitutional. We filed a brief on behalf of the Family Action Council of Tennessee and 21 other state family policy councils. To get an understanding of why we filed the brief and its relevance to the concepts behind the Ninth Amendment that we'll talk about in a later video, you need to appreciate how we described ourselves because it is of fundamental importance, something the court must consider. Here's how we defined ourselves to the court. We are state-based family policy councils that seek to educate citizens and state legislators on public policies that address most closely who we are as human beings. You see, when we speak about marriage, when we speak about the family, when we speak about parents, when we speak about life, when we speak about liberty and religious liberty, they are all grounded in, predicated upon our understanding of what it means to be human. Continuing on, grounding our policy advocacy is the pre-positive anthropology resident in customary and natural law. Now that's written for the Supreme Court, but what does it say? It is saying that our advocacy is grounded on the fact that before there was any judicial declaration, any statute of Congress or state, any constitution of the United States or of the states, there was an understanding of what it meant to be human that those laws were based on, those judgments of courts, those enactments by Congress and state legislative bodies, those constitutions were based on. They're based upon an understanding of what it means to be human that precedes all of those positive enactments of law. And they're found, we said, in the customary and natural law. Now, what do we mean by that? Customary law is what we'd call common law. The fact that over centuries, as we've continued to interact with one another uh, through wars and all numbers of things, we've, we've, we've realized that certain things seem to be true about the nature of things. So, for example, we operate under common law all the time. When you go into a restaurant and order a meal and they serve it, you've entered into a common law contract. You can't dine and dash. You have to pay for the meal. If they don't serve you what you order, you don't have to eat it, and you can leave without paying for it because they didn't fulfill their part of the common law contract. That's what we mean by customary law. Now, we mention natural law. In other words, it's what our founders were saying in the Declaration of Independence, that we are governed by the laws of nature and nature's God, that is created beings, realizing we don't have being within ourselves. We, we, we're not independent existences, our very origin depends upon somebody else having being and ultimately tracing all being back to God, well, uh, there is a law that pertains to the nature of our being. And, and we understood at the time we framed our constitutions, at the time we made judicial enactments, at the time we passed statutes, that those positive declarations of law needed to conform to the law that's true to the very nature of our being. And that's what we're arguing in this brief. That if we don't understand what it means to be human, and if what it means to be human doesn't precede the law that we make, then the law can make us into anything. It can make women who are not pregnant no longer mothers. It can ba make babies in the womb no longer babies. If it can remake what it means to be mother, it can remake what it means to be father. If it can remake what it means to be father and mother, it can remake what it means to be male and female. And here we are today, not knowing who we are anymore. And unless we address that and force the court to recognize that our covenant is based on an assumption of what it means to be human, and it must be understood in light of that pre-constitutional understanding of what it means to be human, we will not interpret the Constitution correctly. 
And so we're challenging the court at a very fundamental level that has been ignored by the court. And the pro-life community has really allowed the court to ignore. No more. That's the purpose of asserting the Ninth Amendment, a vital part of what the Casey Court called the covenant that runs from the first generation to the present. And the whole covenant, including the Ninth Amendment, must be understood. Join us for the next little episode as we begin to explain the Ninth Amendment.